Saturday Stories, everybody. For those of you who are familiar with our program, our monthly program, uh, welcome back. I'm Claire Ponis, and it's my pleasure, as always, every month to bring you a very special illustrator. This uh, month, it's a very special winner. Uh, so we have Zara Marwin, who is the Dillis Evans Founders Award winner for the original art show that's on exhibition at the Society of Illustrators currently. This is a show that's going to run through January the 7th. And I highly recommend if you are in the area to come in and visit it in person because you get to see the artwork by many illustrators. Um, in, you see it in person rather than printed. Although some illustrators work digitally, so that would be a printed um, piece. But otherwise you might see the actual brush strokes of paint, uh, collage. We even have three dimensional art in the show. It's a beautiful show of about 232 illustrations represented out of many submissions that we get for the jury show. Uh, so these are the award winners, um, uh, sorry, not just that, well, awarded either medals. So we have, so we have four, four medals, medals that are awarded, but also awarded to be selected to be in the show. So that in itself is an honor as well. Um, so the Society of Illustrators has been running the Saturday Stories program since 2018. And we did, of course, start it in person at the Society itself. But the Society of Illustrators is a smaller museum. And so we can only um, probably have about 20 to 30 people in the workshops. Uh, but when we brought it to you virtually, which was during the pandemic, as a change of um, pace, you know, because we couldn't do it in person, we thought we'll do it virtually. This opened the door to bring you um, into the homes or studios of our illustrators from all over the world. We've had illustrators joining us from different parts of Europe, um, Mexico and Canada and all over the United States. So that's very exciting. And this morning, Zara is joining us from New Mexico, Albuquerque, New Mexico. So she's on a central time zone. And some of you may also be joining us from different time zones. So do Put in the chat if you're joining us from somewhere or even if you're joining us locally um, near the museum in Manhattan or Brooklyn or the surrounding area. We'd love to know where you're coming in from. Um, this morning, I hope you have some art materials ready. Uh, Zara works in watercolors, inks. Um, she's got a beautiful illustrative style. This is her debut book. It's called Where the Butterflies Fill the Sky. So she's the author and the illustrator of this gorgeous book. And she has won many awards. And as I mentioned, the Dillis Evans Founders Award is a real honor. This is the founder of the entire original art show. Uh, it was founded back in um, 1980 by Dillis Evans and was brought to the museum, um, the Society of Illustrators, where we've been hosting it. It's the actual 42nd um, year of the original art this year, 2022. And um, so, this story is actually a true, true story of uh, Zara's background from when she was a child and had to move from Kuwait, where she was born, where her family is originally from. And they became stateless, which she will explain more in the presentation about her story. And you'll get to see some amazing images as well in her presentation of her inspiration and where she's from. And they moved to America and they settled in New Mexico. And where Zara was in Kuwait was by the ocean. So a very different landscape from New Mexico, which is desert and mountains. And the, the beauty of her style of artwork is that she brings you through all these different scenes with small details. Um, you see, you know, the flora and fauna, which is all the um, nature that she's seeing and also buildings, um, the way people are dressed, traditions. You'll see all kinds of little clues about her traditions from Kuwait and then also the new home that their family made in New Mexico and how they found a new home, which a lot of us can relate to. And myself, I'm from the United, uh, United Kingdom and I moved to the United States. So I, we all have our stories if we've come from somewhere else. And this is what this workshop this morning will hopefully um, get you inspired to think about your home, wherever your home may be. So if you've been um, growing up in one town or city, you notice all the things around you and that are special to you in your town. Um, so Zara's gonna speak to you also about the title of the book, Where the Butterflies Build the Sky, because she would see many, many butterflies where she, her home was in Kuwait. And there's something special about New Mexico that happens every year that they have something that 
is in the sky as well. She'll tell you more about that during our workshop. Uh, so I hope you have your materials with you. If you have any paints, that would be fun. I want to just show you this little palette. This is um, by a company called Uli, and they were sponsoring us, and we hope they will sponsor us again. They gave us a lot of art materials that we've been um, gladly using in our live workshops at the museum. It's a very affordable palette of 36 colors, so it's only about $10, very good to have. Um, maybe you have some pencils and possibly some pens or colored pencils, whatever you have, get your materials ready. And so without further ado, I'm going to introduce for the presentation and workshop, Zara Marwan. It's a pleasure to have you this morning. Thank you, Claire. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Um, I hope everyone can hear me well. Um, thank you for the lovely introduction. I usually have a studio at a place called the Harwood Art Center near Albuquerque's Old Town, but they're replacing windows, so I thought you would enjoy my living room instead. So welcome <laughs> to my living room <laughs> where there's a sleeping cat behind oh, me. Oh yes. <laughs> um, so I wrote this book where butterflies fill the sky about the way it felt as a child to be with my family and home where everything was familiar and my family was always around. And it's called Where Butterflies Fill the Sky because in 2018, I spent three months helping my mom when she left the hospital. And every time I'd look up, there were hundreds and hundreds of butterflies in the sky. But if I bring it up to any Kuwaiti, they'll say, there are no butterflies in the sky. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm a liar. That's what it's like. <laughs> you have to lie. <laughs> well, you, you had that experience. So it's your story. Right. Thank you. <laughs> I'll tell them next time. <laughs> um, so I have a short presentation for you. Um, otherwise, as a child, I was really, really shy. I was really quiet. I have a very large, loud social family, and I loved being with them, and I still do, and I'm still really different from them. Um, yet sometimes I'd feel overwhelmed when my mom would ask me to speak with strangers. Like I still kind of do feel very overwhelmed speaking to strangers. <laughs> um, but then and now I like strangers so much that I keep this timidity aside to be enchanted by other people. So I have a little presentation. Hello to everyone from Nambe, Albuquerque, and Saudi Arabia, and New York City. <laughs> um, yeah. Let me start. I'm going to show you some inspiration. Oh, your audio just went out. That's weird. Can you hear me, Sarah? Can you hear me now? Oh, that's better. Yes, for some reason it just went quiet. It was like, if you're going to share images, you might as well not speak. <laughs> <laughs> There's a long history of seafaring in Kuwait and the Arab Gulf in general. Um, so even our toys as kids were like wooden swings like this. Or it's, it's, oh, this is larger. Oh, whoo, sorry. <laughs> um, there's also a culture of bird keeping on the roofs from pigeons to falcons like my cousin Ahmed here with his child who apparently isn't afraid of this falcon. Um, let's see, here we have um, a traditional house on Felicia Island, which um, I think was built in the early 1900s and a traditional home in New Mexico. So when my family came, when my parents came here, it resembled the traditional homes they grew up in. And there were, I mean, already there were semblances of home and a place yes. that was far away. Um, also off the island, um, I mean, off of Kuwait shore on an island called Felicia, there are Greek ruins and there are Dilmun ruins which is an ancient civilization that spanned from Kuwait to Bahrain. I don't know if it's part of the Septamian. <laughs> I think I should become a historian. <laughs> you will have to. <laughs> <laughs> yes. 
and I'm like, I saw these things and I liked them, so I incorporated them into my book. <laughs> and there were bowls which they left, which I've added to the book. Um, first, from sketches I made while <laughs> in Kuwait, while thinking about what it means to be Kuwaiti or what this ancient art means to me as someone who's from there but can't belong. And we even have things like ancient gods who are surrounded by fish, who are holding falcons like my cousin was. And <clears throat> like this spread in the book, which we'll see later, being surrounded by fish where my ancestors live and are always watching and the Mesopotamian bulls and the Greek and Dillman ruins. Um, on the right is a very charming photo of me and my older brother. <laughs> oh, I love it. No, we are always wearing exercise clothes because I wouldn't really move a lot, <laughs> but I don't know. Maybe it's a thing over there. Um, so this is how old we were when we were. Sorry. Thrown across the ocean. Not really knowing why, yet being welcomed by people in New Mexico. And we have a little friend here who's hugging me, who is here. And I still speak to her all the time. We're very, very different, but she still makes me laugh a lot. Um, and Albuquerque's balloon fiesta, which happens, which is in the book. Here we have my friend Noah, who plays a guitaron. And I wondered, I'm always wondering what it means to be from Kuwait and how I relate to my home. And it didn't take me long to realize that. Some of my friends in New Mexico were feeling the same way. And Noah would walk with his guitaron from Albuquerque to Chimayo with his guitaron, which is a 90 mile walk, I think. And he said, we'll never be like our grandfathers. We're just from different worlds, but we can do a few things here and there that put us in touch with our ancestors. And I kind of feel them when I'm walking. And I, it, I mean, to see this parallel in someone who is still living in their home but feels marginalized kind of reminds me how thankful I am. We came to a place like New Mexico where people experience their language. Um, in the back of the book is my Aunt Geria with her parrot. Oh, um, um, and this is her actual doorway when the borders reopened opened after COVID, going to her door felt almost like walking into a myth. Mm -hmm. Beautiful door. And this is her parrot who she fights, with, or it's not her parrot, it's my cousin Risa's parrot, but she fights with him every Friday before lunch. And this is my uncle Ahmed. My father passed away in 2016. So my uncle usually takes me out to places that my dad would like the fish market or to get a glass cup of coffee while he drives me around his van and talks about their old youth or their youth in the old neighborhood and how they could run to the sea from their old home. And we sit at the sea after the market and he asks a thousand whys about why our family had to break the way it did and why things had to be this way. So this book is really simple. It's only 200 words long, but it, it addresses, oops, uh -oh. oh, there we go. Okay. Yes. A very complex topic of statements. Yes. Yeah. Well, actually, what's beautiful about um, the book is also there's a glossary in the back with a bit more detail. So picture books really need to have less words because half of the story is told with the imagery. So, you know, the words flow very poetically through the story. And then we are able to look at all the details in the images. And you have so many, so it's so beautiful to look at. You can go back and find more things. It's really, um, it's, a, it's a really joyful book to look at. It's amazing. It's like a little map of your world. <laughs> yeah, a little complex image of home, which yeah. I hope will build together now in a drawing. Or I guess I wrote down what home is. It's usually a place where a lot of sunlight comes in. It's very clean and there are floral rugs. Sometimes it smells like good food or too much caffeine. Oftentimes people I really love are there and they tell me funny stories or a lot of details about something very simple. Mm -hmm. My favorite times are when they tell me about their dreams the night before. 
home for me could have a singular tree that I remember, a palm tree next to the house, breaking almond shells, rose bushes my mom would take care of. It could be a large family meal with fish and rice and salads and dates and someone who's upset about something and someone who accidentally falls asleep right after eating. And sometimes we have to leave our homes, even if we really don't want to, yet we learn to love new places and they teach us new things and we grow in ways we otherwise couldn't have. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think, um, you know, for, for our audience who are watching, this is very inspiring for you to think about all the little special things that are reminiscent of home for you. Um, you can bring that into an illustration so so beautifully you know so you don't have to have a lot of words you know obviously you could write it like a diary form but it, it, this is almost like it's a visual diary so I feel like um it, it's a very unique book and I think it's going to inspire a lot of people to, to draw more into details behind the scenes it's in that dreamy way you don't have to have it necessarily like a photographic um, version of your world it can be um details dropped in like you had things like the flamingos that, that there's meaning there in fact in new york city they had some eagles that were um, nesting you know the these things that people will observe in their neighborhoods or around that um, would be really lovely to put into one painting so this is really like um visual narration that you're creating in your illustrations because it's um which is an illustrator's uh, often not illustrators have that as a professional job to you know tell a story through the images um, it, it can be wordless uh, the viewer can look and see uh, the story unfold visually so I think you've done that masterfully it could almost have been a wordless picture book but we do need to know more about your background in the story because we wouldn't have known where you were really writing about specifically, although we can probably tell what part of the world. But um, yeah, so have you, has your family gone to any other parts of the United States? Did anybody move out and settle somewhere else? Or have you all pretty much stayed in New Mexico over the years? Oh, my oldest brother went to Japan. I always say 13 years ago, but I've been saying that for at least the last 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> a long time. He speaks Japanese and works there. And oh, wow. Yeah, so it just kept fun. spreading out. I don't know. Maybe we'll just keep migrating forever, generation after generation. Yes. Well, you know, that's that, that we are more global now. I mean, <laughs> we're, we're, global. Yeah. we're, we're right. learning about each other's cultures, you know. That, so that's really, um, I think that's one of the beauty, beautiful things about, uh, you know, virtual world as well is that we can visit each other. It's been making the pandemic, those two years that were very difficult, more um, manageable, that we could reach other family and friends virtually. So, um, but visually, always I feel like illustration brings more to a story. So do you have any sketches and things that you would like to share of how you thought about going about the book? Your, your art style is already um, detailed in this way anyway that's the way you draw and um, what are some of your inspirations and I showed that developed further into the book um, there I I mean I was there to help my mom and luckily received an art residency at the cultural center over there so mm -hmm. I had a little space to work and meet other artists and yes just developed yes. ideas slowly as I was seeing them and living them and feeling them in real time as an Did adult. Did you gravitate towards those particular art materials that you use right away? Or had you tried different art materials and how did you come to approach this particular medium? Of gouache and the way the colors look, mm -hmm. I apparently never got the consistency correctly. So every time I'd water it down too much, I was like, I should probably just switch over to watercolors <laughs> and work with the watercolors quite impatiently as if I need to finish something as soon as possible. I don't know what this urgency is. Oh, yes, yes, you've got, yes. A lot. Well, actually that's the, the, the joy of looking at your artwork. It feels very immediate, you know, it's sort of like, oh, you know, it's, yeah, I think sometimes if we overwork a drawing, we could lose some of that movement and spontaneity. Yeah, I, I have my own feelings about 
the, the, your style that reminds me of some of my favorite illustrators. Um, so anyway, I, I, I want to hear first who, who you are inspired by, because that's kind of interesting to me. Uh, were you read certain children's books as a child that um, had amazing illustrations in them as well? Um, <clears throat> right now, I'm deeply inspired by like Italian illustrator Beatrice. Beatrice Alemania, of course. Oh, yes. Yeah. She, she made some collages. Mm -hmm. yes. Nothing looks quite like anything I've ever seen. Yes, um, very magical. Yeah, or like Gracie Chang. I like her ink, her brush mm -hmm. stroke, or Mark Majewski, the way mm -hmm. his colors function. Yeah, I feel like there are a lot of contemporary artists whose work is really beautiful. Yes. Yeah, my childhood, my mom subscribed to Dr. Seuss books when we first immigrated here. <laughs> so I received two a month. <laughs> I don't remember particularly being in love with the drawings, but I remember struggling with words like the difference between anywhere and everywhere. Oh, yes. Well, actually, <laughs> you know, Theodore Geisel makes up a lot of his own language. So it's like very uh, imaginative uh, writing and illustration style. Unique, one of a kind. Yes. Um, so yes, if you want to share any um, sketchbooks or anything that you might have visually, or if you want to start um, with the workshop, I'm sure everyone would love to draw some ideas and see you drawing. And sure. Okay, let me set that up. If anybody in our audience has any questions, do pop those in the chat and I will ask Zara your questions for you. And I know she'll be delighted to answer anything that you want to ask her. So it can be questions about her book or her background or um, even her art materials, whatever is interesting to you, please do share your ideas because everybody learns from your questions. So don't be shy. You can ask any questions and also uh, don't be shy about sharing your artwork. So if you do some drawing this morning, we love to see what you've created and um, you can send that to my email address and Tim, who is behind the scenes at the Society this morning, will write the email address in the chat. You will also share Zara's email. She has a beautiful Instagram that you can look at and also a website with more information about her books and a lovely little um, video. Uh, that's a beautiful video um, introducing your book. I, I really enjoyed looking at that too. And Zara is actually she being interviewed and speaking all around the world. She was in Geneva a week ago, weren't you? <laughs> That's I was in Geneva a week or two. Yeah, you're going around the world. It's so exciting. <laughs> I'm so excited for you. And, and you're sharing such a special story that can touch so many people. So uh, from going to visit kids at schools, libraries, bookstores, and then also going to the UN, and all these exciting venues. Um, the public Library, also last week. You, you can follow uh, Zara's adventures. <laughs> can you see my paper? Yes, we can see your paper. How far do I guess? And I think, um, there, there we go. That's perfect. I guess everything will be quite upside down, right? Well, you could paint it and then turn it a little bit so that we can get it, yeah. Um, here are the traditional rugs behind me too, for my parents. Oh, yes. <laughs> Sorry, my yes, gorgeous rugs. Is that, that's, okay. is that wool and silk? What kind of rug is that? Um, I would often sit on these rugs in high school actually to work on my drawings and paintings and still do sometimes, which I guess you shouldn't really. I don't know, you should just love them <laughs> and drink it's your like tea. A magic carpet. <laughs> it's a <laughs> <transport> you. <laughs> mm. So I laid out a drawing very lightly. I don't think you can see it, right? No, no, I can't see it very easily. No, I can see something, but not details. I'm going to use a micron pen. Mm -hmm. Ooh, a number one, it's very thin. Yes. So, let's see. I'm going to draw. Um, can you see anything or should I come uh, up? Yes, it's true, even with a fine micron, it's still a little bit light. Yes, yeah, so as you all know, those participants who joined us before, we are doing this live, so we have to sort of get our um, Maybe cameras. I'll 
videos and everything operational. But yes, that's starting to show up. It can work quickly. And, yes. and um, actually, um, one of our participants, Justin, asks what festivals are popular in Kuwait? That's a great question. What festivals? Hmm. Hmm. I don't know. I don't know. Um, uh, my family is quite religious, so the only things I'd really go to were things called Hesenias. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, but I don't know what festivals happen that are popular. What That's festivals question. are popular in New York City? Yeah, there's a lot of different festivals in New York City because we have so many different nationalities, so it's, it's you know, quite exciting to see all the different cultural festivals that Mm -hmm. um okay is a drawing coming through i yes i'm closer or maybe so i could just... you can talk us through um what you're drawing so that I'm we can drawing people sitting on a carpet right now uh-huh um my dad and his sister um there's a teapot in between them and they're on a rug and the rug is angular. So if anyone in the audience also has interesting um, background or heritage, please do share in the chat. We'd love to hear where you're from. Um, and also if you're from any neighborhoods in New York area, we'd love to hear that. So do share whatever you would like to share in the chat. We always like to sort of tell everybody a little bit about each other because we're not seeing everybody in person. We do have some visitors from New Mexico. Thank you for getting up early this morning mm -hmm. from New Mexico. We have Bonnie, Miranda, um, or oh, Justin is from New York City. Thank you for joining us, Justin. And Stacy says, I think I saw a lovely message. Hold on a moment. Oh, yes, yeah, Stacy said she's very touched to hear your story. Um, so she really found that touching. Yes, I agree. Mm -hmm. And we have someone braiding hair. My mom would braid my hair every morning. When I visit, I ask her to braid my hair still, but she says no. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Justin's got a good sense of humor. <laughs> Getting donuts in the morning is a parade because it's always a long line. Oh, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> Good one. Well, actually, let's see an illustration of that. Yes, I actually, this is what um, drawing live on Saturday stories can actually encourage you to just think of something spontaneously. You've got your piece of paper in front of you, hopefully, and something might just spark an idea. So just draw that idea. Instead of writing it down, <laughs> draw us a visual. So I'd like to see that parade of donuts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> It does sound like a fun festival. Yes, it does sound like a fun festival. <laughs> hmm. um, now I'm drawing a courtyard fountain with a cat looking in and watermelons in it. This is nothing that we've ever had at home, but feels like a cultural symbol that I would have really liked to have in one of our family homes. <laughs> I usually just put in elements of things I would have liked to see, um, like a open seashell with a pearl as a nod to the old pearling culture. So to speak to your um, process here, Zara, you're drawing with a micron pen and then you'll paint over that? Or is it so I, try to make the lines, I try to make the lines quickly and lay out a composition. I first start by playing with a lot of different elements and laying them out. Um, with a really soft pigment before going mm -hmm. over and to move faster when I when I work with ink and watercolor. Yes, you have a really gorgeous color palette. And actually when you were sharing some of the photographs from Kuwait, you could really see that color in the sky and the sand and the buildings. Um, so that's another observation that illustrators, they need to have a good eye for a color. Um, it can be, an interpretation so you can ex exaggerate that color or you can maybe soften it but that brings atmosphere to your illustration so you see the warmth um from actually you go from different color palettes because sometimes it might be indoors 
um, might be a cooler palette, might be later in the day. This is something that illustrators think about and you can see this in Zara's paintings that she does consider color. Um, it's a strong component of her illustration style. Um, and she's filling the page. See how she's building on the page right now, all these detailed drawings. Um, I think it was Picasso who really did prolifically fill every single sketchbook from top to bottom. I think I saw an exhibit of his sketchbooks in Paris a long, long time ago. And every sketchbook, he fills the page, he fills the page. Even if it was one bigger drawing or a drawing with many small details, he liked to use all the paper. Um, so do you do like a wash um, over the entire uh, painting as a background color? Um, I do. I don't have my favorite paintbrush, but I do have this one that comes with watercolor set, which is very fine. It's a fine mm -hmm. tip, but I also have this larger brush to add washes. And I usually add black, black ink last to oh. dark hair. Mm -hmm. yeah. I have a little jar of my watercolors. I don't have many colors. I'm using a Linzer and Newton palette. And I don't know what this green brown is here because I don't usually work in that color. Mm -hmm. So the, yes, these are watercolors, but with wash, you, those are tubes. Um, so you have to prepare your wash in different pots. Is that how you do you um, have wash there or not? Not because you're not in your actual studio. Right? Wash is already here, and sometimes it picks up on older colors and palettes that I've used. Mm -hmm. Soft pinks. Yes. Mm -hmm. I could easily add them to the rug or the skin. So I'm just getting a nice little message from Miranda and she's joining us with her five-year-old Sienna. Sienna Rain, hello, good morning. Hello. And you're from Nambe Pueblo and Stacy is Sienna's auntie. Oh, that's lovely. So this is a family program, everybody. So on Saturday mornings, um, we have some participants who are joining and maybe with a sibling or cousins or friends or an auntie, parents, grandparents, maybe a caregiver or a babysitter. It's really lovely to have everybody joining us, enjoying a behind the scenes look at our illustrators world of drawing and creating this beautiful artwork that you see in picture books. So it's a nice behind the scenes reveal. How does this illustration get created? And I, I love how you drew yourself. So did you um, do a lot of sketches to sort of get that the way you would like yourself to look? Or was it just sort of like, oh, I'm going to draw um, myself and this right. is what came out? <laughs> yeah, a long nose, a little bit curved, kind of messy hair with bangs. Well, it was never messy because my mom took care of me at that age. <laughs> but, <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> I, I yeah, my mom used to put my hair in pigtails all the time. I used to have little pigtails <laughs> clean. My hair was perfect. <laughs> <laughs> um, Were you um, an outdoor child? Did you like being outside, or did you um, like to be? I have more three older in? brothers, so I would just copy whatever they would do mostly. If they were outside, mm -hmm. I was outside. If they were playing video games, I was playing video games. If they joined taekwondo, I joined taekwondo. <laughs> oh, yeah, well, that's. And you have two older brothers. How many um, older brothers do you have? Three, three older brothers. Three. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But you're the only girl. I, yeah, as my family's last shot as a girl, so. You're, um, you're the special. <laughs> um, how do you draw yourself, Claire? When you... Oh, that's a good question. I actually um, haven't so much drawn myself, but in my book that I did, I represented my own daughter who was um, very much interested in performing all the time. If she wasn't doing ballet, dancing and gymnastics or singing, um, she'd be creating some sort of show for us. So my, my book, Circus Girl, is based on her. So I sort of drew a representation of her. So simply taking um, the hairstyle that she had as a child, which is more of a shorter little bob, yeah. and um, 
Yeah, I mean, this is the thing about um, having a, an illustrative style. So for our participants who are interested, we have illustrators represented in the original art show who can draw and paint very realistically. And some of the art materials that are, lend themselves to realistic um, painting are oil paints. Um, you know, artists can work in any medium, but watercolor, paint, and um, definitely oil paints. If you've been to museums and seen more classical painting, it's usually done in oil paint because you can layer it and layer it and work into it and build shadows and three-dimensional um, you know, features, making someone look more realistic shadows and light but um, for illustration um, for anything that's going to be particularly for children's books I would say but also editorial might be illustrating a story that might be in a magazine or for a poster for um, for a theater production or many many things you've seen um, illustrations in stationery stores in gift cards greeting cards wrapping paper you'll see illustrations everywhere you look so an illustrative style gives you the freedom to have your own drawing style. So do not worry if you're not necessarily feeling like you're good at doing realistic drawing, you draw something that is interpretive, like more impressionistic. So just draw simple lines and think about, um, like Zara was speaking about how she drew herself, which is obviously this long dark hair um, so you've got to think about the hairstyle, um, clothing, obviously, and sometimes, you know, illustrators like to draw animals and those animals might be more, um, as you find them in nature, or they might be more like humans and wearing clothes <laughs> and walking around with human characteristics. But with your, um, story, you definitely, um, sort of cross the line between drawing people in situations where they would be, you know, as you did with the, the, the illustration that you shared with us that's in the show, there's your, yourself and your father, uh, he, he's relaxing and you're listening to him. And, and then there was another little scene with soccer playing and et cetera. Those are more realistic things, but we had one of the um, political figures inside a teapot. So that becomes more creative. You know, you can put things um, in different scenarios uh, in, in in picture book stories, so that sort of crosses between fantasy and and, and realistic. Um, so yeah, did you um, do many sketches for your for your picture book? Was it a lot of many sort sketches? Of yes, um, I feel like it went through a lot of changes. So many. Um, every round I'd send to my editor, they'd be like, okay, it's looking really great. Let's go through another round. <laughs> and <give me> a <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And they'd be like, so that when you paint it, you won't have to paint many times, but even after painting, we would have to, I'd have to go back and repaint some things. And, mm -hmm. and uh, usually it's only two to three weeks to retouch all the paintings. It was a really intense process. Oh yeah. Yes. It takes a long time, everybody to finish a picture, but there's a lot of drawings, a lot of um, character development and um, usually there's about 32 pages in a, in a book which includes um, you know the front matter of the book um, but uh, what's I going to ask you do you work digitally at all? Um, no I work mostly traditionally the only thing I do is scan my I don't even know if that's digital I scan the image in yeah <laughs> yeah but just, to, but just to scan it and send it to them. Right. And, and then the book designer would put it into the book. Not, not You're not tweaking it no. digitally yourself. To make sure the colors are resemble the colors on the paper. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. yeah, so you're checking how it would look, yes. Yeah, that's true because often colors can be different on digital to in real life. Mm -hmm. Now look, Sarah's now moved on to a bigger brush. So to add some more environment. Mm -hmm. I wonder what Sienna is making. Yes, yeah, Sienna, are you drawing something? Oh, I got a, maybe another question here. Let's have a look. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, so Miranda says that Sienna is drawing an alien. Oh, we'd love to see that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's beautiful to add imaginary elements to our real lives. <laughs> Um, so after a few layers of washes, I usually add small details. I'm sorry my phone isn't clear to show you. Uh, we've got quite a good view of um, the illustration. Of course, we are seeing it upside down, but, right. but we can see. <laughs> You'll do the reveal. You'll turn it around for us to see. <laughs> oh, there we go. Look, you see the little details. Um, we have a little yeah, that's beautiful. Mask and minaret and letters coming out. Yes, that's gorgeous. So um, here's another question that um, often people ask. So are you sort of mixing between using reference and using memory when you're you know creating the pictures? Because you know some of the things are based on buildings. So do you have a few images around that you sort of refer to? Yes, I use like old photographs sometimes to look at what places have been like because a contemporary city, like most places, I mean, the old historic buildings were destroyed to make urban centers that don't yes. really suit the culture or function yes. really for the way people live. So uh, I like to create these like cityscapes in a way which I feel like are more like a wish of what I'd like the city to have been like rather than what it's really like. Yes, that's actually a good um, drawing prompt. Create a city that you would like it to be like. <laughs> like to what it actually <laughs> could include a donut store near your house. <laughs> With no line. <laughs> With no line, yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah yeah I suppose a lot of these are just like wistful things that I wish had mm -hmm. were um any family members also creators not necessarily artists but they made things yes I have an uncle who's maybe in his late 70s now who is an oil painter he also worked as an electrical engineer because art wasn't really a thing to do mm -hmm. um um so his whole he would be invited to exhibits internationally but i don't think he ever thought he could wow. i don't think he could socially do it full time he always had to remain working as an electrical engineer as well well that's sometimes um you know the case for art because you know it's um yeah, always yes. been the sort of job that you might have to have a backup <laughs> as well as your <laughs> passion um, and then I have an older brother who was inspired by this uncle who insisted that I draw to eat while he was drawing. Oh, very nice. Yeah. Um, do you have any family who creates art? Um, yes, I have a cousin in London who's an artist. Um, I would say my father was very good at drawing and used to draw a lot when I was a child. So I would ask him to draw things and watch him draw them. That sort of inspired me to have um, more of a detailed eye, I would say, because he was, he's, he prefers to draw more, more realistically. And later in life, my mother took to doing more impressionistic paintings. And she's got a very good eye for that. She's very good with color and more spontaneous painting. So and my grandmother liked to sew. So there's always like different um, inspirations when you're a child and you're around people creating things. Um, somebody asked if you drew as a child. Um, that Stacy wanted to know, did you draw a lot as a, a child, Zara? I draw a lot. I remember the drawings I made. I made a Ninja Turtle, which I was proud of. <laughs> <laughs> Fan art. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> yes. I made a Frankenstein, which it was an imitation of my brother's drawing that I was proud of. <laughs> yeah, those are really what I remember. Yeah, I think, um, you know, for our young viewers, you obviously like certain characters. Perhaps you're 
fans of certain books or animations, try to draw the characters that you know you're fond of. That's a good way to start. Or even toys in your room, you know, you can draw their portrait, find one of your favorite toys and draw them, and then maybe make up a story about them and have more drawings of them doing things. Maybe they have a, a, a friend and you can have them talking to each other. That's how stories get started. You just have to think of a character and or a theme. I'm just going to look. Somebody has sent some artwork in already, which I'm excited to now have a quick look. Oh, it's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Cute. Oh my gosh. I'll see if I can put this in the chat. It's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Justin. We do have a, a donut parade for, <laughs> for our viewing. That's fantastic. Awesome. Thanks, Thank Justin. I'll see if I can get it into the chat. Maybe I can send it to Tim and he can do that for me. <laughs> Hold on. I'm forwarding it to Tim. Thanks, Justin. Can't wait to see your drawing. Yeah, and it, it looks like a really um, well lit donut store that one would <laughs> definitely be great. <laughs> Even could probably see it from space. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Justin. Really appreciate you joining this morning. I'm not sure if you've joined before, but we certainly have a treat with Zara this morning. And um, but yes, do turn it around at certain points so we can see a bit more. But yes, yeah, see how Zara is now building her colors and she's doing a little wash in the background. So some artists use a white space um, and some like to color all the background. So whatever style that you like to draw and paint, you do you do your own style, but I do encourage everybody to have a go at new um, techniques because you never know until you try something. You know, if you've got a, you, you feel like, oh, no, I don't want to do the background because it's going to be too difficult to fill in that whole white space. You can see how Zara just moves the paint around. It doesn't matter if there's a little bit of a crossover of the watercolor where it looks a bit more um, like a bleed. That's sort of part of the magic of it. You see the paint. Um, paint texture. Build on layers and they sit on each other very lightly. And... Mm -hmm. Are you using a particular type of watercolor paper? Um, I usually use Canson. Right now I'm using Strathmore because I can mm -hmm. Canson paper. Yeah, I think it's a cold That's... press. Cold press? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. And 140 pounds. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so maybe you can speak a little bit about why paper for watercolor needs to be a certain weight. I'll let you describe. Well, yeah, having some weight to your watercolor paper lets you move quickly with washes or it absorbs the water without getting too wrinkly. Or, I mean, mm -hmm. there are ways to keep your paper flat you could wet the paper and tape it down and then wait for it to dry for a day. But I, right. I really work on heavy paper and hope for the best <laughs> by not adding too much water. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, yeah, there are definitely different techniques for doing watercolor. Wet on wet um, is, is a technique in itself. So yeah, we can explore more of that. I'm sure um, our viewers are excited to always be looking up new techniques and you can find so much um, through YouTube, there are lots of wonderful classes. So, you know, the reason I wanted to share just this little inexpensive palette is that, you know, watercolor can start inexpensively. And as you get to find out if that's something that you really enjoy, maybe you then, you know, um, work your way up into a different set of paints and try those. I must say going to an art supply store is like going to a sweet shop or a candy <laughs> shop. <laughs> It's like, where do I get started with all these art materials? I always buy pastels and I never use them. I just like the way they look together. Oh my gosh, I love pastels. Sennelier pastels. is the most amazing. It's like a box of chocolates. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe you'll, you will experiment with that. I could see you using pastels. Oh, yeah. 
I use them and then I wet them down. <laughs> Just add water to everything is my technique, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's, yeah, that's the only uh, mess about pastels is that, you know, you have to watch it. You don't smudge all your work, you know. So, And actually, this is something that I have a big appreciation for digital. Um, people who are, who are artists who are very good with digital art, they can pick those pastel tools and make amazing pastel art digitally. It's just incredible. Mm -hmm. um, and that's much more difficult to do traditionally because of all the layering with the pastels is... It's a tricky medium because of all the dust and blending. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, it's fun. I totally agree with you. It's so funny you said pastels because I always gravitate towards them as well. <laughs> yeah, the way they suck them up, all the colors are in order. Yes, they look so <laughs> feeling. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so I hope everyone's having, uh, I really appreciate Justin sending in that scene of the donut shop. And I don't know if you were able to click on that, anybody in the chat, but Tim did connect it. I think it, you just clicked to open it. Can you see that, Sarah? Do you want to take a moment to have a look? Here's a piece of digital art, but we can see all the color and the fun <laughs> scene there. It's really great. Oh. <laughs> there's a stroller a truck yes <laughs> yeah there's a lot of detail and, and a good um, viewpoint because that's another thing is perspective it's you're yeah. always drawing many things um that are from different perspectives <laughs> which makes it dreamy yeah so if anybody else has any more questions, I'm sure Zara would be very helpful if you had any questions about how to start a story about your own um, background or where you're living or your home and your family. There's so many things that you can draw. Maybe you have pets, like which member of your family had a parrot? Um, it's one of my older cousins. He's maybe in his 50s and still lives with my aunt. And it's amazing, they live a very long time, don't they? They could live to be a hundred parrots. My aunt says things to this parrot like, we buried our whole family and you're still alive. <laughs> does it Does it talk, your parrot? Yeah, um, you know what? he says meow, so just to give oh, you. <laughs> heard some cats. <laughs> That's very funny. <laughs> My family works. I wonder parrot. what the cats think of a bird meowing at them. <laughs> <laughs> That would be a fun story about the parrot and the cat. <laughs> so Sienna, we would love to see your alien. If your mum could send that in, that would be so fun to see. Ah, so Stacy's asking you, um, uh, at what point did you start to use watercolors? Was that when you were in Paris? Um, no, I kept trying to work with gouache and paint and trying to be very painterly. I kept using gouache here and noticed that it was too watered down. I don't remember it. It was like for a hired project or something. And I just thought, oh, maybe I'll try watercolors and stuck through. Uh huh. Mm. Um, so, yeah, so the watercolors um, can come in tubes like, like gouache. Or they can come in pans. That's what that's called when it's in a palette and it's dry and you, you add the water. With the tubes, um, the gouache, you have to, you know, mix it to a certain consistency. If you want it opaque and thick, you'd add less water or even no water. And then if you want it more watercolor fluid, you'd just add more water. So that's a different, different technique. Do you have any gouache with you there at home or no? Um, I don't. I have this white ink, which I think might be a kind of gouache or a kind of. Yes, actually, that's very handy to have if you're even using watercolor, is to have the white be more opaque because you can add that. Yeah, that's yeah, very good. I'm going to usually take the watercolor pigment without a lot of water to make it thicker and bolder. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yes. So, oh, here's a fun question. Valerie, who's six, was wondering why did 
the parrot meow and who taught the parrot to meow? <laughs> Is there a story behind that? <laughs> a lot of stray cats that like to lounge in the okay. sea in the Kuwaiti shore. So maybe uh -huh. it was one of the cats, maybe a window was open and it was meowing to the bed. Right, that's good, yeah. Thank, thank you. <laughs> maybe the parrot thinks he's a cat, I don't know. <laughs> right, well, sometimes I, obviously animals aren't aware like we are of what they really, <laughs> their size or anything. I have a very small dog, he's a mini Dachshund. And his personality is that of a, a huge dog. He thinks he's really large. He'll chase after deer, like a full stag. He has no fear of chasing <laughs> that deer at all. <laughs> so. hey, actually, I think my cat might make bird noises. So maybe she's confused. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, yes, but the cat would have the bird noises in their to their advantage, right? For right. stalking a bird, tricking <laughs> a bird <laughs> to come in close. Maybe she's not that innocent, I guess. <laughs> So you, you, Zara, draw everything. So that's something that you, you do it so easily. Did you take your sketchbook around and draw from life as you were sort of like traveling or sitting on a train? I mean, what I do is I write what I'd like to remember in mm -hmm. a sentence or two. And that kind of feels like a sketch in itself to have yes. it verbally. And then I let it kind of saturate in my head for a while. And I think that's why the compositions end up being sort of what people say seem dreamlike is because they're not real. They're just how I remember them in a way or the way I think of yeah. them. Yes, that's a good idea too, because I mean, you're a writer and an illustrator. So to keep a notebook and write down words to describe things that you could draw later. Yeah, and just draw them from the words, yes. It happens so fast publicly or when you're living day-to-day -day life that it'd be hard to try and sketch something down as opposed to just capturing it with a few words. Yes, yes, that's true. Or to, I don't know, I, my, I don't carry a lot of things. I don't know if you do. Sometimes I end up just writing what I think on whatever paper is in my bag, like an old receipt. Yes, that's a very good tip. So just have... Um, you know, you could write it on anything, actually. So if you were somewhere, like you say, you were having a, a meal somewhere and you've got a paper napkin. I, I say paper napkin because I don't think the restaurant would want you to <laughs> cotton napkins. But yeah, paper napkin, you could just drop down something that you observe. Um, it could be drawing, in public, drawing in public becomes performative sometimes. Like everybody wants to see what you're creating if you start drawing publicly, but not if you're writing. That's, that's true, that's true. Yeah, so um, actually with the show that we have, the original art show, um, the scavenger hunt little prompt handout that we have for people to pick up at the reception if they'd like to, to do that, they can pick that up with a pencil and go around the show and find things. And some of the prompts might tell you, draw what you see or find a detail, or it might say, write what you see. So you have both options to observe it and write about it or to um, draw it. So mm -hmm. picture books are predominantly words and pictures, but we do have illustrators who do wordless picture books, which are quite stunning as well. Um, okay. Oh, I have another question popped in. Oh. Ah, Justin, do butterflies have a special meaning to you and what are those meanings? Um, my mom's oldest sister, my aunt Amina, gave me a butterfly necklace that I like to keep near my bed. Mm -hmm. I like how ephemeral and strange they are in flight. Like it, they seem to be elegant, but they're really awkward. And But do they have a special meaning to me? Not so much. <laughs> Mm. Well, it makes a, a very evocative title to your book because you you bring um, the audience to a special place immediately with that title. And it did, did have meaning in that moment. You said your mum was, um, was she in hospital, did you say, or she was recovering? She was. It was a really hard time. I had just turned 30 and mm -hmm. 
everything that felt like it could go wrong was going wrong. Mm. It felt strange that every time I'd look up, there were butterflies in the sky. I think it was a particular, particularly rainy spring in Kuwait. Mm -hmm. The butterfly is called the Painted Pink Lady, I think, which migrates all the way to the United Kingdom. Uh, my editor found that out. So lucky. Oh, really? Yeah. So I don't know why there were so many of them that spring. Oh. Hundreds and maybe it did feel like uh, a lightness to the weight of the problems that were happening and maybe could feel like a lightness to the weight of the reasons we had to leave in this book. There we go. If you get asked that question again, Zara, that is the most beautiful answer. <laughs> so that is, a, that is beautiful meaning, actually. So before that moment, maybe butterflies didn't have any particular meaning, but it did hold a special moment. And I think butterflies, they go from being in a cocoon, right, everybody? Like caterpillars, which are very fun to draw, by the way. It's fun to draw a caterpillar. So they are then in a cocoon and then they transform and they grow their wings and off they fly. And that's sort of like a symbol of freedom. You know, they fly off and land on flowers and they help actually distribute. I think they do, right? Do they also help with pollen distribution? It's just bees. That's another question. We always have to do our research. So after we think about something, we can ask that question and find out more about that answer. So. Yeah, so actually your book is um, in the category of, of nonfiction because it's a true story, but it's um, narrated and told in a more magical nonfiction style, I would say, even though it's true, it's got a very um, magical, it could be also anybody's story, but it's your story for sure, because we're seeing your pictures. Um, oh. Yes, actually, Justin's just said that butterflies help to um, fight off pests. Ah, that's interesting. Um, it is nonfiction, but like the drawing where our ants are throwing us across the ocean, I, I think it's how um, I try to play with how things felt as opposed to, again, the way they're done realistically, because we did take an airplane, nobody threw us. <laughs> Yes, right. <laughs> well, it would have been a long boat ride. I guess you could have come by boat. That would have yeah. taken months. Yeah. All the balloons, that could have been magical. Too. All the balloons, I've always thought about being able to travel by balloon. <laughs> or portal, going quickly on a portal or <laughs> time machine. <laughs> I'm going to turn this off now. Okay. So now that you've entered the world of author, illustrator, of picture books, are you thinking about another book that you might have? Yes, the book I'm working on is about longing and friendship and sunflowers, about Van Gogh making paintings for himself and his friend, oh. and the anticipation of his friend coming. Yeah, and one I made during the pandemic, I think missing people, the way we are in a space alone and daydreaming of others. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I think we've actually grown to appreciate more the communication that can be sent by letter or messages. In fact, yes, I suppose we message all the time, don't we? Even if we're using text or um, email. But uh, I, I think also sending things um, as a note written is still very wonderful. And if you've drawn a picture yourselves, kids, I think everyone would love in your family for you to send um, a picture that you've drawn. That's very special, like a, a message by art. Then you, you know, missed somebody. Um, so we're coming closer to the end of our morning, um, but I just want to make sure that we've not forgotten any other questions that people might have. Um, does anybody want Zara to draw something, maybe? Do you want to draw a butterfly? Could you draw a butterfly for us? Yes. <laughs> maybe I'll draw it into the scene. Yeah, you can draw it and then hold it up if you'd like to. Yeah. So butterflies are fun to draw. 
<laughs> Can you see it? It's a very simple one. Next oh, one. Oh, yeah, yes. There we have it. The butterfly is flying past the tree. And this was the full painting, I suppose. I hope you can see the colors better now. Yes, yes, we can see the colors really well. That's beautiful, gorgeous. And is that the size that you work usually for the book? Yeah, usually just 11 by 15 inches. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So illustrators can use um, larger paper than the book is printed. Um, sometimes they work actual size, occasionally smaller, but usually a little bigger is quite good for detail because the book will then just get slightly reduced. Um, did you have any um, issues with the color or did, did, did it come out pretty close um, to what you- Not with the color. I didn't know you had to keep extra margins in the book. So- Oh, yes. Designer is my friend and isn't my enemy for life. <laughs> oh yeah, because actually, yeah, that's true. With a book, you, if you're going to have the pages cut to go into a book, you have to be careful that nothing really important goes off the edges because otherwise that would get trimmed off. And also we call the middle of the book, you know, where the pages join, this is called the gutter. That's, you know, where it's sewn in the middle, like here. Well, this is two images. So this gutter is fine. But if you have a double page spread, which I will find um, an example of that in just a moment, let me see. Like here, this is a double page spread. So if Sarah had painted herself right in the middle here, maybe that would have cut her face in half, which would not have been a good position. So she's nicely placed over here. And the balloons are moving across and it doesn't matter that the balloon is, you know, in the middle there, we can totally see that that's the balloon. So that's something that illustrators have to consider when they're painting um, the illustrations for a picture book is where the middle of the page is. Um, what, what, as a first time um, author illustrator, were there other things that were um, new to you that you learned along the way? Because um, that's always interesting for our viewers to hear some insider scoop. Right. Um, so the template, the margins was new. What is it? Yes, the margins. Yeah, yeah. Um, what about where the words go? How about that? Because you have a lot of detail in your story. So you'd have to be trying to think about some clear space, right? Yeah. So um, I'm learning with my second book that usually a publisher sends you a template where the words go. So you can kind of sketch around it. Some, mm. I don't know what miscommunication happened, <laughs> but I never received a template. So I kind of- I just, don't know if every time, I've, I've not seen that all the time either, to be honest. So that may depend on publisher to publisher. Okay. That's good to know then. <laughs> you don't need a template. So yeah, I tried to think of spaces where the text could potentially go and drew around it. But that was yeah. a learning experience to think that text had to be applied to an image. And consistency in image. Yes, yes, consistency in image. That's absolutely correct because if you were drawing, um, for example, you drew yourself with long hair, if down the, through the book suddenly you had short hair, it might be disconcerting because you might not recognize you right away. However, if you were to have a haircut and that was shown in the story, then it would make sense. But if you didn't show that and all of a sudden your character had a different hairstyle, they may not be recognizable. So you do want your character to be consistent. Um, of course, they could maybe change their outfit. But that might be because they're going somewhere in particular. So that's part of the, the storytelling as, as well is, um, you know, what's in the background, what they're wearing, what, where the scene is. Um, but yeah, your actual character should be recognizable and also, um, I think drawing your character from different angles, seated, standing, all very important in storytelling um, and not so easy always to do. So you have to have a bit of a practice at that. You I mean, you draw lots of little drawings of your character in different positions, turning around. Um, what else do we think about in pictures? Oh, zooming in and panning out like the bowls could appear several times throughout the story or mm -hmm. the idea yes. of butterfly showing up even in Albuquerque. Yes. Was, was the weather fairly similar? Um, yes. 
when my parents moved back to Kuwait, they used to like to come to New Mexico in the summer because it was cool. So it's a little hotter in Kuwait. <laughs> a little hotter. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because of course they've got the mountains and the desert and the, it cools down in the evening. Cool. Like 25 mm -hmm. degrees this morning. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so where are you going next, Zara? What's your next um, trip? What's my next trip? Um, I'd like to visit my mom in the winter, like I always like to do. So I yeah. hope to in December, but for work, I think my next is Tucson, the Tucson Book Festival. Oh, fantastic. Wonderful. Yeah. So if you happen to be in that area, um, the book festival is open to the public too? I think so. I think so, right. And you can get books signed sometimes at book festivals. So that's really fun. Meet the author illustrator in person. Yeah, it's always good to, if you have um, the opportunity to meet a, an author or illustrator, that's very fun to meet them in person. Um, what else can we just share before we almost are at the end of our morning's activity here? <laughs> Anybody else got anything to share? Please do send in your alien drawing. Um, that's Sienna's drawing. She'd have her mum send that in. I think your aunt would love to see it too. <laughs> Do we have anybody working on, oh yes, she sent it. Oh, good, good, good. I'm gonna have a look. <laughs> so, yeah, with this um, next book that you're working on, is it um, going to be imaginary characters or are they based on people that you know? Because sometimes that happens by chance. Not people I know, but it's Van Gogh and Gauguin, Paul Gauguin. <laughs> oh, yeah, sorry, exactly. Yeah, okay. Sorry, yes. I don't know them. I never. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Hold on. Oh, yes. I'm just like getting this illustration. Hold on. Oh, cute picture of her, too. She's adorable. Wow. That's fantastic. Okay. I'm going to see if I can send that to you. I'm going to send it forward it to Tim quickly because he's <laughs> my behind the scenes technical support. Um, you'll love it. Very cool. Um, well, thank you everybody for joining this morning. And for those who, um, you know, obviously some people are busy on Saturdays or they have religious um, commitments on a Saturday, this will be um, uploaded onto our YouTube video. And if you want to revisit this and take a closer look at um, Zara's illustration again and get inspired to draw more illustrations yourselves, you can check out our YouTube channel, Society of Illustrators YouTube channel. And um, the book will actually be probably edited a little bit because this is a brand new book just out this year. And this can be um, purchased obviously in bookstores. We'd love to support local bookstores, but anywhere books are sold. Plus it can be um, picked up at the library to you know, visit your libraries. Um, we really recommend taking a look at this book in person. It's a fantastic book and um, inspire you to do your own stories for sure. Um, let me see, we've got, okay, so this illustration has just come in. If you want to take a look, Zara, <laughs> this is from Sienna. Beautiful, Sienna. Thank you, Sienna, for sharing and your mind. It's beautiful. And a horse or a rabbit? Yeah. So, yeah thank you and, you know congratulations but, but thank you thank you for saying that bonnie she says thanks zara and claire <laughs> my pleasure always it's totally my pleasure to bring you illustrators every month um but particularly thank you to you zara this morning i know you said you're shy but you're doing such, such a fantastic job of sharing your heartwarming story plus your amazing illustrations and style and you know this is always very, um, you know, engaging for our audience to see you at work early in the morning on a Saturday in New Mexico. <laughs> um, so uh, congratulations, Bonnie said on all your awards. Yeah, we totally agree. Yeah, well deserved. And we hope to see much more of your work coming in the future years in book form and also in galleries. Um, we really love your work so much. Thank you. And it was fun to see you at the opening where you won your award in person. That was awesome. And do visit us again. You know, perhaps we'll have Zara with her next book come to the Society of Illustrators and do an in-person workshop, which would be really fun.
So have a great weekend ahead, everybody, and happy Thanksgiving to you all if you're celebrating next week. Um, to you too, Zara, have a wonderful rest of this season and into 2023. Yeah, you're Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks, everyone.